Great. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, Deep Learning and Computer Vision. Um, so this is the ML Monday for this week. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, we had a, a, guest, a, a few guest lectures on the previous ML Mondays. So this is going to wrap back to the first um, session on uh, deep learning with um, fully connected layers. And so um, I'm going to start with a brief review. Um, uh, can you raise your hand if you went to that, by the way, the first ML Monday? OK. Nice. Um, yeah, so the way we motivated um, our first uh, discussion was um, there's this XKCD comic um, from about 10 years ago or so, uh, which is like um, when the user takes a photo, um, the app should check whether they're a national park, um, which is easy, right? You can just um, uh, use any GIS library and check whether they're in a park. Um, and check whether the photos of a bird, which used to be extremely hard. Um, she said, I'll need a research team in five years. But today, this comic no longer makes sense. Um, as we'll see later, um, you don't need a research team in five years to do this anymore. Actually, you just need a collab notebook in five minutes. So we're going to go through a code example where we do exactly this um, at the end, where we detect whether a photo is a, uh, of a bird or not. So let's go through a review of um, what we talked about the first session, which is that um, machine learning operates essentially on data. I mean that like the idea of um, traditional programming is that we write a bunch of explicit rules um, for how programs should behave. Um, and that in machine learning, we don't write the rules directly. Instead, we curate a big data set of um, data relevant to um, uh, the problem we're trying to solve. And we have the machine learn from that data set. And so there's a bunch of different types of data we can use. Um, there's textual data, um, image, audio, video, numerical, et cetera. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. And today we're, uh, today we're gonna focus on uh, image and video. So image, um, images are just going to be tensors, um, as a review from last time, uh, or matrices, right? Except um, since you typically have a red, green, and blue component, um, there'll be like three matrices um, stacked on top of each other. And so uh, that we'll call tensor. And then a video is just um, a sequence of images, uh, of image frames, uh, along with the audio. And then, yeah. So um, here's a visualization of a tensor. Um, we have this like scale going from a scalar, which is just like any number, like 0 0.5 or negative pi, um, all the way up to a tensor, which has a number of dimensions. As you can see, every time we just add dimensions. A vector is a list of scalars. A matrix is essentially a list of vectors. And a tensor is essentially a list of matrices. You can see like the dimensions being extruded, um, but you can think of a tensor as a general, uh, generalization uh, of a matrix. Um, and the idea of a neural network is that we can uh, represent everything as a tensor and apply some kind of neural network architecture, um, where we can multiply it by other tensors um, and get the result we want. Uh, and in particular, images are really uh, easy to represent as tensors. Um, because uh, you can see here, um, you can represent their pixel values. So here, for example, is the blue channel um, of the picture. Uh, you can see that the intensity of the blue pixel at this top left corner is 33, and that the intensity of the blue um, channel at the bottom left corner is zero. And so this will form like a blue image, and then you also have the green and red image components uh, of the entire image. And if you put those together, you get the full color image. OK. Um, and then we also talked about the idea of flattening a tensor, which is where you can take a tensor, which has a lot of dimensions, and remove a dimension of it by essentially like taking it and then like slicing it up um, along a dimension and like stacking it along that dimension. Um, so I think this, visualiz uh, this visualization does a really good job. If we look at this matrix, what we can do is we can go row by row and stack the rows lengthwise. And now this is just a vector. OK. Um, and on to neural networks. Uh, we talked about how we could create a fully uh, connected uh, neural network where we have an input layer that we feed a vector into. Um, we'll multiply by weights matrix um, and add a bias term. Uh, and then we'll pass that through a nonlinear uh, non layer, uh, which is an uh, activation function called a ReLU. Um, and if we repeat that uh, over multiple layers, um, we eventually get an output vector result. So um, here comes our question. Last time we talked about MNIST, right? And we showed how you could classify MNIST, um, the Heterogen um, uh, Digits data set, 
um, using just a fully connected uh, network. Um, so this network um, we often call fully connected or a uh, multi-layer perceptron uh, or a bunch of linear layers. These terms are all equivalent. Um, each of these little uh, circles, is, these neurons, uh, are often called perceptrons. And so uh, MLP, um, multi-layer perceptrons, uh, is a common way of describing this. So fully connected, multi-layer perceptron, or linear layers um, are all equivalent. Uh, why can't we just use this architecture um, to classify images? And the answer is that we can, um, but uh, our accuracy may suffer um, in that like, it will not be nearly as efficient to train these models. Um, does anyone know why? Or uh, would like to venture a guess as to why? Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Um, that is one of the reasons. Uh, any other reasons? Yeah. Uh, there will be, there will be too much, too many features. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There will be a whole, like, there will be a ton of weights. Because if you have, like, um, like a 1,000 by 1,000 image, then um, how many pixels are there? 1,000 times 1,000, which is a million, right? And you need to multiply each of these pixels by, like, um, some kind of weight. Um, you need to do that for like every layer. So you'll end up having like millions and millions of like weights um, for not that uh, much accuracy. Yeah, so we went over this. Um, uh, so part A of uh, suboptimal architecture um, is about like how if you have a ton of pixels, then you need a ton of weights to operate on those pixels. Because um, a, in a fully connected layer, you need like a weight uh, uh, for every pixel, right? That you're gonna multiply it by and then um, uh, add a bias term to and continue propagating on. Um, and it also doesn't um, make use of image characteristics uh, at all. So it doesn't have any spatial understanding. Um, and it'll be clear after the next slide. So when we fed the tensor to the network, um, we were essentially flattening the uh, matrix. So we would take like some kind of image and then flatten it so we can feed it into the input layer. Um, but what this does is this actually gets rid of some of the spatial um, data in the image. So as you can see here, if we were looking at these like green and yellow pixels as a human, they're adjacent, right? And they should be considered like very close to each other. But if you flatten the image, now they're like suddenly very far apart. And especially um, as images are large, this becomes a problem. So for example, um, imagine that this row was like a thousand pixels long and that this row, yellow row, is also 1,000 pixels long. Um, these uh, pixels might be like 1,000 pixels apart um, in the flattening, even though they're actually adjacent in the image. And so we don't really want to spread out all the spatial data. We want to keep it uh, together. And so that's why we're going to use um, a new architecture called a convolutional neural network. So there's a number of parts uh, of a convolutional neural network. Um, there's the convolution. Uh, there's the co convolutional layers, uh, there are pooling layers, there are, uh, there's a flattening operation, and uh, there are fully connected layers, and finally a softmax. So let's start with the convolution. This is the core of convolutional neural networks. In general, convolution um, is just a mathematical operation on functions, um, and if you take in Diffie-Q, um, you'll go over the continuous form of this. Um, if not, then uh, don't worry about it because the discrete uh, form that we use here is actually quite different from that. But um, just like in the grand scheme of things, a convolution is a general um, operation you can apply on functions. Uh, specifically, the type of convolution we use in a convolutional neural network um, uses a matrix called a uh, kernel or a filter. Um, and these are actually weights that are parameters that you train in the model. The, uh, here's an example of a kernel here. Um, you see this like three by three matrix. Um, that is a kernel that you're gonna pass over the input to get to the output. And we'll go over an example in depth uh, right now. So the way this operation works is that you take an image and you take some kind of filter matrix and you essentially pass the filter over every window of the image. So for example, we'll take this filter and pass over like the top, very top left most window. Um, and what we'll do is we'll multiply every corresponding element of these matrices. So 1.2 will be multiplied by 1, 1.5 will be multiplied by 0, 2.1 will be multiplied by 1, and so on. 
And at the end, you're going to get nine values. And if you add all these values up, you finally get this value of the output, 5.3. And so we element-wise multiply. And we accumulate, meaning we, after we multiply all these elements, we get nine uh, resulting elements. We add them up, accumulating them into a single uh, value, which we put into the output matrix. Does that make sense? So um, if not, we'll uh, go over uh, another example shortly. Um, but the idea is that we define some kind of filter or kernel matrix, and we're going to multiply uh, element-wise by the image uh, over a particular window and uh, continue to slide that window over the image until we get an output matrix. Um, so some intuition on this. We can use convolutions to detect edges and other kind of features uh, of the image. So for example, if we construct our uh, filter um, kernel like this, where we have 1, 1, 1, uh, 0, 0, 0, and negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, um, this will essentially represent um, a vertical feature or like vertical edge detector. Um, and so if we pass this uh, vertical filter over the image, we get this resulting output. So if we do, uh, perform the convolution operation between this vertical uh, filter and the image, we'll get this output. As you, as you can see, the uh, vertical edges are really highlighted here. And so this like image has a lot of data. This image is a lot simpler. Um, and will be easier for our uh, neural network to classify as part of uh, uh, what it does. And in a similar vein, this is a horizontal uh, edge detector. We can just transpose the matrix, right? Um, or like flip it uh, about its like diagonal. And then if you uh, apply the convolution operation, then you'll get the horizontal edges, right? So very similar deal. If you look at the difference between these two images, um, you can see like certain uh, like areas are um, highlighted more than others. So you can see like these doors, for example, right? The um, uh, height of the door uh, being shown. Uh, whereas like in the horizontal edges picture, um, they aren't really shown nearly as much. Um, and so like these filters can actually essentially like uh, change your perspective uh, on an image. Um, and it it'll uh, essentially simplify the representation for the neural network later down the line. So um, here's another example uh, of a convolution operation. So here we have i, which is the image, k, which is the kernel, and i star k, which is the output of the convolution. Star is um, typically the symbol used to represent the convolution operation. So if I do i star k, that means the convolution between i and k, where i is the image and k is the kernel. And so um, what we're doing here is we're just passing the kernel again um, uh, along the image. So here, uh, for example, we take this window, um, 100, 111, and we multiply it element-wise by 101, 010, and 101. So here we take the top left uh, pixels, 1 times 1, um, this pixel 0 by this pixel 0, and so on. Um, and we'll get a set of nine values, and if we add them together, we get four. And we do this for every single possible window um, of the image. So we can go through this uh, step by step. Um, in brief, like we'll, we'll start with the top left window. Um, we'll take this window, multiply it by the kernel, and we'll get like this resultant output pixel. Same for the next pixel, and the next pixel, and the next pixel, and so on. Right. And we do that for the entire image. Um, now, here's a question for you. Uh, I told you that the kernel matrix um, all of the values in the kernel matrix are parameters, meaning that this kernel matrix, um, the values will change over time as the model uh, trains on the data. So if there are like a lot of vertical edges um, in the data, it'll start to make the filters look more like vertical edge detectors. So in this case, how many parameters are there in a single uh, convolutional layer with a single filter? There's uh, only nine parameters, right? Because the only parameters in play here are um, all these values. So every single value in the kernel uh, matrix is a parameter learned by the model. Um, and uh, nothing else is a parameter. And so like, if you know all of the values in the kernel, then you can pass it through the image and you get the output layer. And this is very different from, or in contrast to the case of a fully connected 
uh, layer. Because in a fully connected layer, you need a weight for every single um, pixel that you're going to multiply it by. So here we have a, a what a, a seven by seven image, right? So we might need uh, 49. Um, we would need at least 49 uh, parameters in a fully connected layer. And so this is a, already like a very small image. Most images in real life will be hundreds by hundreds of pixels. And so if you imagine like a 1,000 by 1,000 um, pixel image, the number of parameters required by a fully connected layer might be um, a million or more. Whereas here, it only um, the only parameter count incurred is that of the kernel. So even if you have a 1,000 by 1,000 image, the kernel here is still 3 by 3, so the parameter count would still be 9, um, ignoring the bias term. Does that make sense? So the purpose of a convolutional layer is, uh, to, uh, is twofold. One is to reduce the parameter count, um, and two is to make use of spatial data. So here we consider all of these adjacent cells as like essentially a logical grouping um, instead of flattening the image and thereby destroying a lot of the spatial data. And um, you can think of this as somewhat similar to how a human sees, because when you look at an image, you'll look at like little bits at a time. Um, and so that's what the network is doing too. It'll take the kernel and it'll pass through um, all these windows like one at a time uh, through different types of filters um, to get different features of the image. So um, here we take a look at dimensions. In particular, notice that the output um, matrix is smaller than the input matrix. Uh, can, I, can anyone explain why that is? Yes. Yeah. Um, why does that cause the output image to shrink? Yeah, um, that's right. So we lose like the left edge and the right edge and the top edge and the bottom edge as we like go uh, past the window, uh, past the kernel along like the entire image, right? So like um, to be completely clear, what's happening is that like this red box um, shows the possible centers of the kernel, right? Um, so like the most top left I can center the kernel is like right here. So this zero would correspond with that one, right? It's not possible for me to place the center of one at this zero, because then it would uh, extend outside of the image and there's nothing to convolve with. So for the convolution operation to be defined, um, we need to pass this kernel uh, over like, at the very start, this zero as the center of the window. And so essentially what will happen is that like, if we can only pass um, the kernel over the image uh, for these centers, then like the leftmost center is here, the rightmost center is here. The possible centers is a five by five um, matrix, and therefore the output is also five by five. Because for every unique center of the image, right, um, the, we, we're going to get a single value um, for that pixel in uh, i times uh, i covolved by k. Is that clear? Uh, another way. Uh, Okay, um, let me ask this. If we take k to be a five by five kernel instead, meaning pretend that there are values out here, like let's say like this is one, zero, zero, one, or whatever, right? Um, on the edges, um, like let's say there are values similar to this. What would the new um, size of the output uh, matrix be? So previously in the three by three case, the possible centers are from, um, in this highlighted in this red box, and so it'll be five by five. Now, if we um, increase the size of the kernel, then what should the um, output uh, matrix size be? In particular, sh should it be smaller or larger than, the than in the case with the kernel th three by three? Smaller. Why? Because you're cutting off one of the edges. Of yeah, the exactly. Uh, well, what, what would the exact dimensions be? Um, yeah, it should be three by three, right? Uh, it's not. It's not super hard. Um, just like imagine where you would place like the center of um, this image, right? If it's five by five, then you'd be able to place it here, right? Or here, or here. But you can't extend it further because then there's like no uh, pixels along the edge to convolve with. So like the only possible 
um, pixels you can choose to center are in the three by three matrix. So the output uh, would be nine. Um, so sometimes you don't want uh, this to happen. Sometimes you want the output image to be the same size as your input image. Um, and so in that case, you'll add padding. Uh, and another modification you can use to a uh, convolutional layer is called stride. Um, and in stride, you basically skip over pixels um, to like move faster and also like I think essentially reduce the size of your uh, output image also. So um, here's an example of padding. Typically, um, if we want to keep, if we want the uh, output image to be the same size as the input image, we'll add a bunch of zeros on the outside edge. And what that will do is that it'll make, uh, it'll allow us to uh, like um, extend the centers beyond like uh, to, to we, it'll allow us to um, put the center of the kernel um, anywhere in the image. Um, so in this example, we can choose like one as like essentially a center. This is a two by two matrix, so there's not a well-defined center, but you can imagine like um, the like center of this image corresponding here, right? Um, to this like top left edge uh, or the top left point. And so if we extend the boundaries of the image with zeros, then we can now apply the convolutional filter to uh, every single pixel um, of the image. And so we'll get uh, an output matrix of the same size as the input matrix. So the input matrix is just these four by four values, and the output matrix is these four by four values. And the zeros are just there um, as temporary like values so that we can apply the convolution filter, uh, the convolutional filter to the image. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so uh, this is what we call padding equals same because we're keeping the same dimensionality uh, of the matrices. If you um, set padding equals none, then there will be no padding. So it'll be in the case as before. And we can also apply um, something called stride, um, which is kind of similar to if you think about stride um, in terms of walking. So uh, if you have like a larger stride, then you'll like move a, a larger distance with each step, right? Whereas if you have like shorter stride, um, you'll move a smaller distance with each step. So if we set the stride higher in the convolutional layer, we'll essentially skip over more uh, cells as we apply the convolutional filter. So in the previous examples, our stride was one, um, and in this example, the stride is two. So notice what happens to this matrix. We start here with the top left corner, and when we move the window, we don't move it by one, but we move it by two. You see what happened here? Um, we skip over like this window because the stride is two instead of one. So when the stride is two, we move two at a time. So we move two pixels to the right, right? Um, and this will correspond to that top cell um, in the output image. Then we move two, again, pixels to the right, and that'll correspond to that top right cell. And so notice what happens to the output image. Um, it becomes much smaller when the stride is two because we're skipping over a lot of cells, and so we're not going to compute those uh, convolutions. The other um, aspect of a layer is that it'll have multiple filters. So uh, previously, we looked at the case of a single filter. What we'll do is we'll just like take different filters. We might have like a vertical edge detector and a horizontal edge detector and like a circle detector or a bunch of other detectors that the convolutional neural network learns uh, through training. Um, and so we'll have like a whole bunch of filters uh, in a particular layer. And you define how many uh, filters you want in a layer. In this case, we have eight filters. And so we'll like, learn like these eight different like features uh, of the image. So in this case, how many parameters are there? We have eight filters, uh, max mean filter in this case, and each filter is one by two by two. So remember, um, in the case of a single filter, that the number of parameters is just the number of elements in the filter, right? Because those are, those are the only like, elements that we learn um, at that level, uh, if you exclude the bias. And so here, if we have eight filters, we just multiply the number of parameters by eight, right? So if there's two by two, which is four parameters in a single filter, if we have eight of them, then there are 32 parameters uh, for this entire layer. And um, here you can see uh, an example of the PyTorch documentation. 
um, which shows you what a convolutional layer looks like. In this case, they call it Conv2D um, because the matrix is essentially two-dimensional. It has a width and a height. And then you can see that it has uh, a whole bunch of arguments, um, such as the number of input channels, number of output channels, um, the size of the kernel. This would be like three by three, for example. Um, the stride, uh, which is typically one, but you, uh, which you can set higher as a padding. Um, and some other parameters that uh, aren't too that aren't too important. Um, and as you can see, like uh, we have um, essentially the output layer equal to a bias term plus the convolution uh, operation applied to every possible window uh, of the image. Um, so the PyTorch documentation just expresses this in uh, mathematical form. So everything we talked about. Um, is implemented very directly in practice um, in PyTorch, TensorFlow, and other machine learning libraries uh, as convolutional layers for you to work with without um, implementing the convolution yourself. So that was the convolution um, part of a convolutional neural network. Um, are, there any, are there any questions about that? Cool. Um, let's move on to pooling then. This one is actually uh, pretty straightforward. Um, it's a lot simpler than a convolution. Uh, what you do is you just take, um, you, you divide up the, your uh, input image to, into like a bunch of um, parts based on your filter and stride. And then you'll take the maximum value within each region um, in the case of max pooling. So pooling basically means uh, taking, like, taking an input image and reducing its size um, by extracting like, some kind of features from it. And max pooling specifically means taking the maximum value in each region. You can also use min pooling, where you, use, you take the minimum uh, value in each region. So here, for example, we divide the input image into four regions, blue, green, yellow, and red. And in every region, we take the maximum value from that region. So for example, here, um, the maximum value is nine. So in the output um, image, the corresponding value is nine. And here, in this green region, the largest value is seven, so the corresponding green value in the output image is seven, and so on. Here, um, when we say filter and stride, what we're saying is that um, we're gonna skip two at a time, so each of our regions will be two by two. Um, and the filter will be, yeah, two by two also, right? So the filter here actually is not truly a filter in the sense of a, a kernel that you learn in the convolutional neural network. The filter is just a way of like, the, um, we're just saying like the size of the regions that you divide. Does that make sense? So we just want some terminology to explain like how large are the regions because um, if this was another image, it might be like three by three regions, right? Uh, or like 100 by 100 regions even. So um, how many parameters are in a max pooling layer? And uh, here's a hint, this is a trick question. Yes, um, why? Yeah, there's nothing to learn, right? There's no parameters to like multiply um, the image by. Um, and so like, this is just a very um, straightforward deterministic operation where like, you just take the maximum value in each region. And so there's nothing you actually have to learn. There's just an operation that'll reduce the image's size. And so if you have like a 1,000 by 1,000 image, if you apply a max pooling um, layer, you might reduce its, the image's size into like, let's say 500 by 500, or perhaps more than that. And you'll basically just like, um, the neighboring uh, pixels might not carry a lot of significance. It's like in an image, you might have like a bunch of blue pixels by each, uh, each other. And then like the brightest blue pixel is the one you care about as characterizing that region as blue. Um, and then we have the flattening layer, which is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, you just take the matrix and you slice into rows and you concatenate along rows, right? Um, and you do this like after all the convolutional um, pooling layers, um, right before you pass it into a fully connected layer. So the idea is like you, you take the convolutional neural network, you break it into two parts. There's the convolutional part, which is where you have these convolutional and pooling layers that learn like what is the spatial representation of the image. And then you have the fully connected part, which is where you classify um, what you, the features you got from the first part. And finally, you have um, something called a softmax. So what is a softmax? Um, as the name implies, we want to take a maximum 
uh, to determine like what we should classify the output as. Um, however, we don't like uh, want to directly like we uh, call like what is the maximum. Instead, we want to um, translate our output values into a set of probabilities. And if we take the maximum of the probabilities, then that's how we know what the most probable class is. So essentially, in these vectors, each value corresponds to a particular class. So for example, this might be the probability of a cat, the probability of a dog, the probability uh, of a sheep, the, prob the probability of a zebra, and the probability of a lion. Okay? And so 0 0.9 would signify that we have a 90% chance that it's a, uh, it's a, what did I say was the second animal? Uh, a cat uh, or a dog. Uh, whichever you uh, designate as uh, the label corresponds to that probability. So the reason we need to apply softmax is because we want to get a set of probabilities. We just have a set of values. So here, at the very end, once we um, perform a lot of matrix computation, we'll have some kind of flat vector right, um, of values. But these aren't probabilities because they don't sum up to one. Okay. And um, the probabilities have to sum up to one if you're classifying, because the probability that it's something um, is 100%. So it doesn't make sense to have like a 130% chance um, of like the image being a zebra. And so if we apply the softmax function, then we can get to the set of probabilities. Notice here what we're doing is we're taking uh, e to the power of each term, and we're dividing it by the sum of e to the power of each term. So um, we're essentially taking this like average, uh, or like we're, we're uh, normalizing um, each feature, right? Um, by like the total uh, weight uh, of the entire vector, right? Um, and this equation might look a little weird. Why are we taking e to the power of things, right? Instead of just taking like vi over the sum of vj, meaning like um, if i is like a particular value uh, or a particular index in the vector, like let's say it's uh, 5.1, and then j will loop over the entire vector, right, and add everything up. So essentially what we're saying is, if we didn't have the e to the power of term, then the first value would become 1.3 over the sum of all this. And the second term would be 5.1 over the sum of the vector again, and so on. And that would still um, result in a vector with essentially a list of probabilities. They would all sum up to one, right? Because if you take e of, uh, or if you take z1 plus z2 plus z3 plus z4 plus z5 over that sum again, you would get one. Um, we, the reason we take e to the power of is to exaggerate the difference between large and small values. So if you get like somewhat similar values in the output layer, like let's say it's like 0 0.7 and 1.1, we can exaggerate the difference between these values by um, taking e to the power of. Uh, and so like large values will get really boosted, and that's why like this 5.1 term right becomes 90%. Um, and it really highlights like the large terms and really like de-emphasizes small terms. And so like we're pretty confident in this case that it is a, a cat um, or whatever label you attribute to that, that index. And then there's another historical reason, um, which is that uh, this area of machine learning actually came from thermal dynamics. And so if you recall uh, Gibbs free energy from um, chemistry, right, um, there is a, uh, a, a, a probability distribution um, and thermal dynamics uh, called the Boltzmann distribution, right? Very, very similar, um, which you can use to derive the softmax function. And so it actually has a thermal dynamic interpretation. Um, and this is just like a, a relic of history. Um, it's pretty interesting, but you don't need to know thermal dynamics to do machine learning. So here's the full convolutional neural network. We take the input image, we eventually get the output classifications. Um, and the way we do it is we split it into two parts, feature learning and classification. So feature learning is going to take the convolutional layers um, as well as ReLUs, um, which we call are just like the um, nonlinearity that we uh, add at the end of each layer. So we have a convolutional ReLU, and then we take a pooling uh, layer, uh, max pooling, for example, and then another convolutional layer with a ReLU, and then pooling again, and so on for however many times you'd like. And at the very end, when you want to perform your classification, you, um, you flatten the image, and then you uh, send it to a fully connected layer, then you send that to a softmax, and finally you get a list of probabilities corresponding to, for example, a car, a truck, a van, and so on, and bicycle. 
So this is the full architecture uh, of a convolutional neural network. Yes? I'm confused why you need to go to the um, Were you here for the first uh, ML Monday? Uh, do you remember um, the part where we talked about how uh, weights are essential? Like, if you mu just multiply the weight matrix by um, the uh, image, you would get a, just like a line or a linear transformation? So the reason we need a ReLU is to be able to capture nonlinear um, non patterns. So for example, if I have a circle and I want to classify the circle, um, our equation without the ReLU would be like W times X, right? W times X plus B, um, which will just be a line. Uh, but if we want to classify a circle, then we need some kind of more general form of equation, which is why I apply the ReLU. And if you apply the ReLU, on top of like the linear layer and do this a bunch of times, you can actually, there's actually a mathematical theorem that says you can represent any function in this manner. Yeah. So that's why ReLU um, is, or activation layer uh, is also often called a nonlinearity because it's the part of the network that allows you to express nonlinear functions. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Um, okay, so let's go into the um, the implementation. Let's do this and let's try to speed run this. Where is the, uh, oh wait. One sec. It's somewhere. It's this one. No, it's not that one, sorry. I think it's something the lecture notes. How do I get this to drop down? No? Oh, no, it's on the next slide. <laughs> Duh. Um, yeah. OK, so this is um, a um, Jupyter notebook uh, or Colab notebook that trains a convolutional neural network in PyTorch. Um, so we're running this on a Google Cloud GPU, and we're going to train uh, a convolutional neural network to um, detect birds um, and other uh, animals. So I'm going to run uh, all the code cells first so that um, we can talk about uh, the implementation while it's training. But this should overall take like um, less than five minutes. Okay, cool. Let's um, start from the top. So this is actually an, an official PyTorch um, tutorial. Um, and you can search up the notebook for yourself. Um, CIFAR 10 is a well-known data set for um, image classification. And um, what we're doing is we're going to um, essentially like define the convolutional neural network um, and train on this CIFAR 10 um, uh, data set. So first, we'll, uh, and don't worry about like the exact line by line level of the code. Um, what really matters is like the high level, um, what we're doing uh, in the more abstract sense. So um, we're essentially gonna grab all the data sets. Here we get the CIFAR 10 data set, and we're gonna split it into a training set and a test set. Um, because you recall from our first lecture that uh, you, you want to train the neural network on some um, uh, large part of your data set, but you want to reserve or hold out um, a small por portion to make sure that it didn't just memorize the training data. So you're not going to train on the test set, only the training set, and you will evaluate using the test set at the very end. So you can see the classes here are also uh, known as labels. These are the types of objects that our neural network will be able to classify. So they include a plane, a car, a bird, and so on. Here we uh, visualize a couple of examples. These are very low resolution images. And the reason for that um, is to provide very fast training. Also, large images um, take up a lot of space. And so if we want to like, maximize the number of images we can fit in like, a certain size of data set, we want to minimize the size of um, the image. Also, it makes the, uh, it actually harder for the neural network to learn because it's blurrier, and um, it will need to uh, perform better, essentially, to uh, recognize the image. So this one, for example, is a frog, right? Um, but it's like kind of hard to see even for a human. And so like the neural network um, 
If it doesn't perform well, it'll have a lot of trouble with it. So our goal is to make sure that the neural network can classify correctly. Here we define the architecture. So first we start with a convolutional layer. This is a number of input channels, number of output channels. Um, I don't actually remember what this term is. But the good thing is you can always search up uh, documentation. So it looks like number of input channels, number of output channels, and the kernel size. So I think this should be like uh, a five by five kernel. So uh, and with three input channels and six output channels. And then we perform a max pooling operation. Um, I think this is probably like stride and filter. So this should like um, reduce the image size in half by taking like every like um, two by two region of the image and then taking the maximum pixel value in that. We apply another convolutional layer. And finally, we apply a bunch of like, uh, we define a bunch of linear layers. Actually here we don't apply anything. Um, here we just define a bunch of layers. So this we call comp1, this we call full, comp2, and a bunch of the fully connected layers. Forward is where we define the applications. So we first take, X is gonna be um, the input image or tensor. And what we're gonna do is we're going to um, take X, we're gonna apply the convolutional layer, we're gonna apply the ReLU, and then finally we're gonna pull that. And we're gonna do that uh, again for the second convolutional layer. Then we're gonna flatten, and then we're gonna apply the ReLUs uh, to the convolutional layer for bo uh, both convolutional layers, and finally, the last convolutional layer. Then we define a loss function. Cross-entropy loss is often used for classification. Um, you can also look into this if you like. Um, it uh, is pretty interesting. Um, I think it has like some logarithm terms to um, uh, express like parts of information theory. Um, but uh, this tends to work really well in practice, um, and it's reused a lot for classification. And then we'll um, run over the training set. Oh, it looks like it's already finished training. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll run over the training set, uh, train on all the data. We call that an epic is, the full, uh, is a full iteration over the data set. So we iterate over the entire data set twice. I'm trying to minimize the loss. You can see our loss is going down, um, which is good. It looks like it's doing well. And now let's get a couple examples. So, um, yeah, so it looks like this is a cat, ship, ship, and plane. These are um, examples from uh, the test data set. And then finally, we want to take a look at, um, where the outputs from the neural network. And we can see um, this is a cat, ship, ship, and plane, right? And the same um, ones are, it's actually not doing very well. I think it said cat, car, car, and ship. I think if you uh, train it for more epics, then it'll do better. Sometimes there's some variance in how well your model performs. Um, what if we try to do this again? So. So we get a different batch, right? Frog, frog, car, and frog. Oh, yeah, it's doing a little better. It still thinks it thinks this is a cat, it seems. But um, frog, frog, cat, and frog. And then uh, just for fun, let's try to find one that's birds. See if it gets the bird right. not a lot of birds in this data set. Okay, so there's a bird. Um, and so if we run it, who we get, and it correctly classifies that this is a bird. And so uh, we solved the XKCD comic um, in about five minutes. Cool, and then um, at the very end, you can get like the total accuracy of the entire data set. It seems that um, we're not doing super well because we didn't spend much time training it. Um, typically, neural networks you will train for like hours or days instead of like minutes. Um, and so this is actually like quite good for the amount of time we spent on it. Um, yeah, it looks like the accuracy is only 50%. But it's a lot better than random guessing because if you were to randomly guess, since there are 10 labels, we get about 10% accuracy. 
Um, and there's some more um, parts that you can go through if you look at the PyTorch tutorial. But um, that, I think, pretty much wraps up um, the lecture. Uh, there are some other things that uh, we can potentially talk about uh, in a future lecture. Um, for example, some of the history of the field, um, as well as other tasks like object detection and image segmentation. When I say history, I really mean the history of like research papers. So the uh, convolutional neural network, for example, was essentially invented in 1988, but people didn't really use it back then. People really started using it around 2012, when this paper called AlexNet um, won this competition called ImageNet, um, which is to classify a bunch of images, and it won it by a huge margin. And so that's what like really got people really interested in convolutional neural networks. In 2015, Microsoft published a paper called ResNet that improved upon AlexNet using what are called skip connections. And then in 2020, um, there's a paper called Vision Transformer that improved upon, it actually doesn't use convolutional neural networks anymore, it uses a transformer to um, classify images. Um, and that seems to perform better um, in certain cases. Um, and then there are a bunch of tasks that you can do in computer vision that are more advanced than um, object recognition. For example, object detection, if you have a picture and you have like a tennis ball, can I draw a box, can you have the machine draw a box around the tennis ball? What are the coordinates of the tennis ball? Like what um, is like the tightest bounding box around it? And then image segmentation. For a given image, can you classify all of its pixels into something? So if I, for example, have an image of traffic, can you classify, like given a, if I like point at a particular pixel, can you tell me, is that a pixel of like a traffic light or a car? Um, and there's some other uh, tasks in computer vision as well. Um, but yeah, this wraps up uh, lecture for today. Um, if you want, I can uh, do a follow-up um, on ResNet, Vision Transformer, and some other uh, object, uh, some other computer vision tasks. Um, but thanks for coming. Um, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, typically what's done in practice is you just use ResNet, and then you use ResNet which has like 50 layers, um, and you just like apply it and it tends to like work well, re really well out of the box. And then if it doesn't work, then, then you might want to start like playing around with the layer sizes. It's really hard to tell actually, it's like this like weird black box that you're like poking around. Yes, you can just import ResNet from PyTorch, and then you can just like use it out of the box without defining a model or anything. That's what you do in practice. Although um, we like wrote our own or, or like use a custom one for uh, educational purposes. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Um, yeah, I'm gonna stop recording now. Uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>